Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this learning session. Today, we're going to be discussing with you the key findings from our State of Mobile Internet Connectivity Report, or SOMIC for short, with a special focus on low and middle income countries, where mobile remains the primary way, and in many cases, the only way, for most people to access the internet. First of all, I would like to acknowledge our partners, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, and the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, CEDA, thanks to whom we're able to produce the content that you'll be hearing about today, and so much more. Now, mobile internet, it's definitely transformed our, our lives in so many ways, from business opportunities to education or health, information, finance as well. I don't think there's any area that has not been transformed by digital technology in the past two decades. And a lot of it is happening in the palm of our hands. At the end of 2021, 55% of the world's population was using mobile internet. And for the first time last year, half of the population in low and middle income countries in particular are connected. So for all of us in this session, it certainly feels like mobile internet is everywhere now. Yet there are still 3.6 billion people who aren't online either because they live in an area without broadband coverage or much more often actually because they live within coverage but are facing barriers that are preventing them from using the internet. And as the global recession, recession continues, the situation really often worsens for those who are already most likely to be digitally excluded. We know that being connected is much more than just about infrastructure. It is also about ensuring that people can use the internet to meet their needs in a way that is safe, but also enriching and productive. For digital inclusion to become a reality for everyone, we need to understand and tackle the barriers that people face, whether it is their lack of awareness, not being able to afford the right phone, or not being able to understand how to use the internet. At GSMA Mobile for Development, we've been working with the mobile industry, with technology companies, um, the development community, but also governments to increase access and adoption of mobile internet with a specific focus on underserved populations. We're working together to focus on the key barriers that still prevent billions from using mobile internet. And I will just mention two examples. The first one, we're helping people to learn how to use mobile internet for the first time. We're doing this with a free open source suite of content called MIST with two T's like in training toolkit that has been translated now in full or in part in 18 languages. 50, five zero million people in 27 countries have received this basic digital skills training already. And an impact analysis has proven that it is very successful in significantly increasing usage. Second example, we're putting very strong emphasis specifically on reducing the gender gap in terms of both mobile internet and mobile money. Through our GSMA Connected Women Commitment campaign, over 40 mobile operators have committed to measuring the gender gap in their customer base, to setting targets, to designing and implementing action plans, and to reporting on their progress. Collectively, they have successfully reached over 55 million additional women. These two examples, and there are many more, highlight how taking informed targeted action can really make a difference at scale and help drive increased digital inclusion for those who are currently being left behind. Now, my colleague Claire is going to go much more into detail, and I hope that the session will inspire all of you to take action, to collaborate and to innovate, to develop the solutions, the programs, but also the policies that will ensure that no one is left behind in the digital world. Thank you and enjoy the session. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Max. Um, and great to see so many people joining in today. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing uh, some of the key findings from our latest state of mobile internet connectivity report. Um, and um, then we're going I'm gonna have a chat with the uh, one of the uh, lead authors and then open it up to answer questions from you. So please, if you have questions, please do add them into the chat and, and we'll try our best to, to answer them. Um, my name is uh, uh, Claire Sipthorpe. I'm head of our 
uh, digital inclusion programs in M4D at GSMA, um, and we're absolutely delighted to, to share the findings from the recent report. And I'd like to thank our lead authors, Anne Delaporte and, and Calvin Bahai, um, as well as, as Max mentioned, um, our donors, FCDO and CEDA, for, for making this possible. Um, we publish this report every year, um, and it looks at the kind of key trends, analyze key trends in terms of mobile internet use for using both supply and demand side data. Um, I'm going to, as I say, mention, I'm going to share the, the kind of main findings and uh, also the link at the end to the, to the report. So first, um, let's look at the kind of global trends. <clears throat> you can see um, from, from this slide that um, there's a, a, a connected number of people uh, using mobile internet is increasing. There are now 4.3 billion people now using mobile internet, which is about 55% of the population. So that's really impressive and, it, and it's growing. You can see it's grown um, by 300,000 users in the last year are now using the internet. That's a very positive story. Um, but um, on the other side of the slide, you can see that there are still 3.6 billion people who remain unconnected. Um, so next, let's look at, you know, who is not connected and a bit more about the unconnected. Um, basically, there are, of the people who are not connected, there are, there are those who are um, not covered by a mobile broadband network. We call that the coverage gap. And then, but the vast majority of the people who are not connected uh, live in an area with coverage, but they're not using um, the internet. This is what we call the usage gap. <clears throat> so you can see 40% are living in areas with that, um, covered by mobile broadband, but not using it, compared to 5% are, are not covered with a network. Now let's look at the sort of trends um, over time. Uh, you can see from the, the red line that there's been um, a steady growth in mobile internet usage since we first started tracking it in 2014 in our reports. Um, and much of the growth um, in the last year has come from, in terms of mobile internet usage, has come from low and middle income country. And so as a result, for the first time, half of people in low and middle income countries um, are now using mobile internet, which is great. Um, if you look at the gray line, which is mobile broadband coverage, you can see it's continued to expand slowly and the coverage gap is, has been reducing it, reducing. And the blue line is the usage gap. Um, and although it's decreasing, um, it went from 45% in 2019 to 40% in 2021, it, it remains substantial and it's almost eight times the size of the coverage gap. Now let's look at, um, what what it's what sort of it says at a regional level and how this varies, um, <clears throat> you can see. Um, at, if you look first at the red boxes, that looks at who's connected. We can see um, that there are substantial variations at the regional level. So, with less than half the populations in Middle East and North Africa and South Asia being connected, and only twenty two percent of the population in Sub Saharan Africa. Um, but it's if you look at the gray boxes, which is the coverage, you can see that. Um, that uh, it's substantial, um, remains substantial in Sub-Saharan Africa at 17%, whereas in the other regions, it's much less, less, less of, a, of a challenge. Um, and the blue, which is the usage gap, um, again, you can see that in, in Middle East and North Africa, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, they have their substantial usage gaps. Um, in South Asia, where there's over, there are over a billion people living uh, within mobile broadband coverage area by not using it, um, so that's so then absolute um, numbers that's quite high and in, in sub-Saharan Africa it's lower but then in terms of absolute numbers but the coverage gap um, these are the usage gap is higher with 61 percent of the population living in coverage area but not using it so again this highlights if you look at also at a regional level um, that coverage is not the main barrier to mobile internet but rather there are other barriers that are stopping people from using it I wanted to just double click a little bit further in terms of who's not connected <clears throat> we did this year we did some analysis looking at least developed countries and separating these out um, from other low and middle income countries just to see how it differs. Um, and the results are quite interesting to see. You can see on this slide um, we have high income countries in the right. So 83% of population in high income countries are connected, and only 1% are not covered by mobile broadband. The middle group, we have low and middle income countries, excluding least developed countries. And you can see again that there's steady growth in reducing the usage gap in the blue, um, similar to high income countries and in terms of growth in the number of people being connected and a small coverage gap. But on the left, if we just look at least developed countries, we see a very different story emerging. 
um, the growth of people connected is fairly flat. And at 20%, it's less than half of the other low middle income countries. Um, and we've seen no change in the usage gap, remains, which remains large at 61%. LD's low, least developed countries are also the hardest to reach in terms of coverage, and the coverage gap remains substantial for this group of countries at 18%. So again, if you see, if you see when we look at just least developed countries, um, the story is quite different. <clears throat> and now, again, let's look a little bit more about who is not connected. Um, you can see that sort of 94% of the young connected live in low in income countries. Uh, but within these countries, there are some groups that are less connected than others. For example, those living in, in rural areas, adults are 33% less likely to use mobile internet um, than their urban counterparts. And women are 16% less likely to use it than men. Um, there are also substantial variations in terms of income with the poorest 20% of the population is 49% less likely to use mobile internet than the richest 20% in low income countries. So these are the groups that are the most, currently the most underserved, among the most underserved of, for mobile internet. So that's the sort of the state of play, but I think it's, um, let's look at the sort of barriers, um, the key barriers to, uh, to why people are not um, using the mobile internet when they do live in areas of coverage and what's driving this gap this usage gap that we're seeing. Um, first, there's awareness. Um, we, we do a survey in a number of countries. And we ask people if they're aware of mobile internet. And you can see that even though in many of the countries where we surveyed, you know, over 80% are okay, people population aware of mobile internet, there are some places where it's low for lower, for example, in India and Bangladesh, where it has it's much lower and has been unchanged since 2019. We also see there's certain segments of the population that are less aware for example, a woman and people living in rural areas are much less aware than, than their counterparts. Um, so awareness, you know, while while there is high, relatively high levels of awareness, it is um, it remains a challenge, for, especially for certain segments and in certain countries. And once um, people are using a mobile phone and are aware of the internet, we ask. We ask, you know, what are the quest what are the key barriers that are preventing them from using it? And we're seeing that um, the sort of top reported barriers among um, mobile users aware of mobile internet are literacy and digital skills. This includes functional literacy, as well as not knowing how to use a phone or not knowing how to use access the internet on a phone. Um, and uh, women in um, rural uh, populations and those on low income and those who are over 45 are, are more likely to port this as a barrier. And then affordability also is another critical barrier, particularly the cost of an internet enabled handsets, also data costs, but internet enabled handset comes out very strongly and safety and security issues also comes up in terms of top three barriers. And I think it's worth looking at the uh, affordability barrier a little bit more. Um, when we look at it, we, we, we look, don't look at just the absolute cost of an internet enabled handset, but what this would cost in proportion to an average monthly GDP per capita. Um, so that's how we're defining affordability. Um, and here we can see that, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, an entry level internet enabled phone would cost a quarter of a person's monthly income. So that's quite substantial and 22% in South Asia. So these are, you know, this is a significant cost uh, for, for people. And if you, we again did a further analysis looking at the poorest 20% of the population and not surprisingly, affordability was an even greater barrier. A handset, an internet enabled handset in entry level one would cost on average more than half a person's monthly income to purchase. Um, so I think this highlights that we really need um, innovative solutions to try and make it affordable for people um, such as handset um, financing schemes. And we highlighted some of these initiatives in our, in our, more recent, in our recent report on um, making internet enabled handsets more affordable. But I think this just sort of helps highlight just the sort of this, this sort of issue for, for those who are on lower incomes and the kind of scale of, of what we're, what it means in terms of um, them being able to purchase some of these devices, which they need to be able to go online. Um, yeah, so that's it from me. Um, I just want to, uh, here's a link to the report. Uh, feel free, there's a lot more detail in it. Feel free to download it. And again, I wanted to, to thank our, our donors for supporting us and enabling us to do this. And I'm now going to um, invite Calvin to join us, um, who is one of the lead authors. Welcome, Calvin. Um, thank you, Claire. It's great, 
It's great to have you. So you've been um, working with us on this report since we started publishing it and spending many years looking at all the different data points and analyzing it. So when you think about this year's data, what, what kind of stood out for you the most? Thanks very much, Claire, and uh, really a uh, pleasure to be here this uh, morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever anyone is. So as a report co-author, um, obviously, I think all of the material is stand out. So I encourage everyone to, to, to read everything in the report. But if I was going to talk about one thing, um, I think I would probably highlight an aspect of affordability around mobile data. So in this year's report, for the first time, for the countries for which we have data for, we found that more than half of, in more than half of low middle income countries, the cost of one gigabyte of monthly data was less than 2% of monthly GDP per capita, which is a threshold that's uh, often used uh, following targets set by the ITU and the UN Broadband Commission. Um, so I think this is a very encouraging trend. Um, it reflects the general downward trend we've seen in mobile data prices in most countries um, in recent years. And it's, it's a little bit in contrast to what you just showed around handset affordability, which declined in some regions, but in general has been quite stable, especially in, in, the, in the last few years. And this is actually something that's quite consistent with the consumer survey you mentioned and, and what we publish in the report. So when we ask the unconnected uh, why they are not using a phone or not accessing the internet, I think you highlighted digital literacy and skills were key barriers. But when it comes to affordability, they're much more likely to cite uh, barriers around handset affordability rather than mobile data. So I think that's consistent with uh, with what we're sort of seeing on on uh, on our own trends in that as well. Now, in, in many markets, mobile data is, is still unaffordable. Um, and in some, the average hides uh, a lot of constraints for uh, the poorest population segments. And in fact, in this year's report, we show that if you just look at affordability for women or the poorest population segments, then yeah, in, in most uh, low middle income countries, they're still uh, quite far above the 2% of monthly income threshold. So we do need to focus efforts on that in terms of policy. But um, in general, I think this is one of the positive things. I think we spend quite a lot of time rightly focusing on the persistent barriers, and we do need to solve those. But in terms of, I guess, something that's quite a positive development and, and sort of good news story, I think mobile data affordability is something that we've we've generally seen good progress on. Thanks. That's really interesting to hear. Um, it's good to hear that there's positive progress. Um, and just to remind for those listening, um, Calvin's here for, you know, after I, I have some questions for him, but then I'm opening it up to the floor. So please throw your questions in the chat um, and, we'll, and we'll pass them on to Calvin. Um, so one thing we did differently this year, which we haven't done in the past, was we looked at mobile internet connectivity just for those who are 18 and above, um, because we wanted to see for you know what it was if we just looked at the, that adult segment, you know what it looked like. And I'd be kind of curious um, to hear from you, you know, what did that highlight for you, kind of, um, you know, when you looked at that, what did you what did you see from that that was surprising or interesting? Yeah, no, very very interesting. So. <laughs> So in the presentation you just showed, uh, one of our headline numbers is that by the end of 2021, 55% of the world's population was using mobile internet. Now that figure is based on us taking the total number of unique mobile internet subscribers and, and dividing it by total population. Uh, but when we talk about achieving universal connectivity by 2030, for example, I don't think many of us have in mind connecting every single person in the world when you take into account children, uh, young infants and babies. And this is an issue, uh, particularly in many countries that have very young populations. So no, the, the countries aren't the same in that regard. So if you take sub-Saharan African, for example, half the population is younger than 19, whereas in Europe, half the population is older than 43. So those adoption estimates that we show by region they could be a little bit overstated when you take some of those demographics into account. So we've been aware of this for a few years. Uh, it was mostly a challenge around data, uh, but as you say, we have published estimates. Um, so I just, just want to note to our viewers and our readers that uh, we do listen to feedback by um, from you in terms of our analysis, and we do try and improve the analysis over time. So do if you've got any suggestions for us to, to enhance the analysis or the report, please do let us know. Um, but anyway, in, within the report, the headline statistic is that if we just look at adults aged 18 and above, 
70% of adults uh, worldwide are using mobile, we're using mobile internet at the end of 2021. So it gives you quite a different perspective from that 55% figure that was used before. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, where, which as I mentioned before, has a very uh, young demographic, then the data we just showed suggested that 22% of the population was using mobile internet. But if you just look at adults, uh, the proportion is around 40%. So, um, and in, th in that case, we're excluding uh, a number of children who you probably wouldn't expect to be mobile internet subscribers. Um, and that difference is quite stark for sub-Saharan Africa. It's not as large if, if you compare the what we published, for, for example, for North America and Europe. Now, that being said, there are two things I wanted to mention around that. I think this is, I'm really pleased that we've done this and I'd like, I hope we'll, we'll be tracking it going forward. But the thing I probably, what two things I wanted to note was first, even if you use, look at adults only, you still got almost a third of adults worldwide who aren't connected um, and a lot more in many countries as well. And the usage gap that you mentioned is still uh, much, much larger than the coverage gap. So I think in terms of the key points you highlighted before, they don't really change depending on the metric you look at. Um, the second thing I wanted to highlight is having published this, uh, we published it in October, I've actually presented this to a number of audiences and people. And a common response I've got is, is that this has been, this, it, it's very helpful, useful and informative, but they also say it's really important that we don't ignore the relevance of connectivity for younger for younger people, especially children who now rely on the internet, for example, for online learning and education. So I think this new analysis does give us a better understanding of connectivity and it's important to track, but it definitely won't be the only one we'll be focusing on. I think, you know, a lot of the feedback we've got in terms of trying to make sure we look at connectivity amongst um, young people as well is, is important too. Thanks. I think I agree that it's important to to look at these different slices, but we have to, have to acknowledge, as you said, that there are some people under 18 who would very much benefit from the internet. Um, <clears throat> so I also mentioned in a presentation that, again, you know, in addition to looking at looking at adults um, in response to sort of a request to do that, um, we also kind of did a more detailed look at both connectivity and affordability first you know, some of the most unconnected, particularly those in least developed countries, as I shared with lower incomes. Um, so having done this extra bit of analysis this year, you know, what struck you from that? Was there anything particularly interesting from your perspective that came out of that analysis? Yeah, so when we did that, I think we all expected, I don't think anyone's surprised that if you look at the, the least developed countries um, that are, that are um, identified as such by, by the UN, um, we knew that obviously their connectivity numbers would be lower. In terms of the magnitude, I probably wasn't too surprised by that either. If you compare them to other mostly middle income countries or high income countries, I think the difference is we, we knew and we expected to be quite, quite stark. But there were two things that struck me. One is actually, I think you, you actually mentioned before, which is that when you look at the growth in connectivity over time, in the least developed countries, it's been very limited. Uh, so in the last, in between 2020 and 2021, I think we saw effectively a one percentage point increase in mobile internet adoption. Um, whereas if you look to other, again, low middle income countries, but I suspect most of them would be middle income countries, um, their connectivity levels are not only almost three times higher, but they're growing more strongly as well. And even in high income countries that have, you know, many of which have probably reached saturation, we're still seeing growth in those markets as well. So that did strike me a little bit because um, from an analytical perspective, given that the least developed countries are starting from a very low base, I probably would have expected that to see uh, to be growing more strongly. And I think in, in some respects, that's perhaps one of the more concerning aspects of, of the report that we found. The other thing that was striking that we, we also included in our report was if you look at the connectivity gaps within least developed countries. So you showed the, the very, I think, very important analysis in terms of gender and rural populations. If you look into that further, you'll see, for example, that in least developed countries, uh, rural populations are around 50% less likely to use mobile internet than urban populations compared to uh, for around, uh, I think it's 27% in other um, low middle income countries. If you look at the gender gap in LDCs, the gap's around 42% compared to 13% in other low middle income countries. Similarly, that the poorest uh, income quintiles are much, much uh, less likely to be 
connected compared to the richest uh, quintiles compared to other middle income countries. So I think those uh, those gaps, th those magnitudes, sorry, surprise me because it highlights that if you look at the digital gaps within countries, they're much bigger within um, least developed countries. And it shows that those underserved groups in the poorest countries are really most at risk of being excluded. So I think those are probably the two things around that analysis that, you know, one, when, when we sort of dug a little bit further were quite striking. Great, thanks. And in, in my, when I was sharing the data, I was highlighting just the importance of the usage gap, just because the numbers are so much bigger there. But, you know, um, Obviously, coverage is still an issue, and as you mentioned, in some of the LDC least developed countries and in some places. So, um, and we see that in the report that it, the coverage gap, you know, as coverage has been gone further, it's the it's slowing in terms of um, it's the way it's closing. Um, how do you think we can sort of address the coverage gap? Because uh, we get to hear because I I focus a bit on the usage gap, so we get to hear your view mm -hmm. on the coverage gap. <clears throat> Yeah, so on, on the coverage gap, um, in this year's report, we so this is something we, we, we obviously highlight in every year's report, but this year we dug a little bit further into the coverage gap and we actually highlighted, we highlighted two parts of the coverage gap. So you, you mentioned in your presentation around 5% of the world's population or 400 million people uh, don't live in an area covered by, by a mobile broadband network. Now around half of these or 200 million people they are covered by a 2G network. They're not covered by what we would call mobile broadband, which is 3G, uh, 4G or 5G. So for that population, the goal um, is, is effectively to upgrade those sites to at least 3G, ideally 4G um, going forward. And for that, there's probably a lot of, particularly a lot of focus on the demand side where if uh, users in that area can be um, incentivized or if you can increase demand, to upgrade to smartphones, um, that allows the networks to be upgraded in a manner that's economically sustainable. Because operators will upgrade if they know that they'll um, obviously if there's uh, if there's an economic case to do so. So, and that's when we when we talk about the closing of the coverage gap. A lot of the gains in recent years have been effectively upgrading um, 2G sites into with with newer technologies. Um, that's especially been the case in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's that's one part. The other half of the coverage gap, which is the other 200 million people, um, those are people who aren't covered by a mobile network at all, not even 2G. Um, and the challenge there is, is particularly great because it's not just an upgrade, you effectively have to deploy new sites and infrastructure, which is much, much more costly. And in the areas we're talking about, they're more sparsely populated, lower incomes, so you're talking about lower revenue opportunities and returns as well. So... In a lot of those areas, the cost of building um, new sites using traditional technology is just, uh, it, it isn't going to be sustainable in the long term. So it requires some new innovations. In the report, we actually highlight some of these, um, particularly on the mobile operator side, where we see some operators deploying new innovative low cost sites that are more suited for rural areas. And we've actually got some case studies in the report, for example, in uh, Uganda and and Democratic Republic of Congo, where we've seen some of these provide um, mobile broadband connectivity in in underserved areas. So hopefully, that, I think that's an area of promise that will that will go push going forward. In some of the areas we're talking about here, even with some of those uh, newer technologies on the mobile side, I suspect it will still be a challenge um, because in some areas, even if you've got everyone using mobile, the the they're so uh, the, the population density is so small that everyone could be using mobile, but again, the, the cost of deployment is just too high. So I think this is an area where we're going to need, obviously, newer innovations, um, new alternative technologies. Uh, at the moment, I guess the one that's most talked about and the one that shows most promise are non-terrestrial networks, including low Earth orbit satellites. I think someone in the uh, in the chat has actually mentioned that already, uh, which I think was a useful, useful point. Um, so that I think that's that's one example that has promise. I guess the only thing to consider is that with regards to that and those other technologies, um, there are obviously still technical and economic hurdles to overcome. And I'm also conscious, I suspect you may be too, Claire, given how long we've worked on this. We've seen a lot of promising technologies in the last five, 10 years that have sort to close the coverage gap. There was a lot of excitement, but 
in the end they didn't achieve the scale um, or in some cases didn't materialize at all so i hope we'll see, well, hopefully we'll see some progress on that and we'll be monitoring it but i think closing the coverage gap for that last five percent is going to be really really challenging and we've seen progress slow in the last few years and i think trying to address that's going to be it's going to be very very difficult Thanks. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I have one more question from my side, and then I see we have a number of questions in the chat, which I'll I'll get to. So if you, again, I'm just sort of tech, taking a step back, and you know, um, what you know, I sort of shared what the data said, but just be here to your personal opinion from looking at the data. What do you see as like the, the big challenge and the kind of where you know where we should focus our efforts? So if we're really to kind of sort of move the needle on this digital inclusion, you know, where do you think we should focus our efforts? Yeah, that's a very yeah, very very open, very big question. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, so. Again, if if we sort of go back to when we first started this report, uh, I believe the first one was uh, we did it in two thousand eighteen, and actually this this report is uh, accompanies our mobile connectivity index, which we've uh, now have data for going back to twenty fourteen. If we go back to when we first started doing this, and we talked about digital inclusion, a lot of the discussion was really around the coverage gap. Um, I think partly because the gap was much higher back then, so it, it was clearly more important. But I think there was also just a lack of understanding around the usage gap and the idea that you can have areas where you have coverage and access, but people aren't using it. That probably wasn't so much of an issue for obviously people like you and myself and people people who worked in the industry in the sector. I think this was, you know, they, they sort of understood this. But if you were talking about... Uh, for you know key decision makers and policy makers i don't think they were they obviously weren't as familiar with the connectivity data so i don't you know i think the the obvious thing they often might focus on was around coverage and and not around the usage gap now in the last few years i think we've seen that switch around i think the coverage gap gets a, a, a lot of attention as it should do because we discuss the challenges in closing that but obviously the usage gap is much higher is much greater now and I think we're seeing that reflected that in the discussions. So we, I think we see a lot more discussion around things like device access and affordability. A few years ago, I don't think I saw policymakers talk as much about digital skills as I do now. Digital skills and literacy, I think, is you know comes up almost all the time now when we talk about you know trying to close the digital inclusion gap and, and connect the unconnected. So I think that's very positive, and hopefully it's that will continue. I think. We've, in terms of both the work we've done in this report, in the connectivity index and on the consumer survey, those barriers to adoption have been, they've been pretty consistent and persistent in that, you know, the most cited one is around skills, um, uh, digital skills and literacy. Next one is usually handset affordability. And then depending on the country, there are often barriers around content and safety and security. So I think continuing to focus and, and on those is, is going to be the key, um, a key issue. I also, I guess, would just sort of highlight one of the things that comes out of this report is that we talked about the difficulty in closing the coverage gap. Within the usage gap, connecting a lot of the remaining unconnected populations is going to be much harder than what we've probably seen in the last few years. So if you take, for example, the, the handset device costs, in many countries, you can now get an internet device for, for $20 and sometimes less. It could be that at some point in the future, there'll be a device that's profitable that could be sold for $10. I don't know how feasible that is. But even if you do that, that's still going to be unaffordable to many of the, the, the poorest uh, population groups. So and similarly with, with mobile data, you've got prices, you know, you can get gigabytes of data in some countries for one to two dollars, sometimes less. And it's difficult to push that lower. So you I think there's obviously going to have to be some new, uh, probably innovative uh, ways of approaching this. Uh, to tackle those barriers. Similarly around literacy, if the main barrier is, for example, a general lack of literacy or ability to read and write, then that's very difficult for operators, for example, or even uh, ICT and telecom regulators to address that. It's it's a much wider issue that requires more a more coordinated approach, uh, but also, again, new, new approaches and new ways of thinking. So hopefully on our side, we'll continue to do our sort of efforts to try and monitor and track that and hopefully see improvements going forward. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be the, the the connect addressing the a lot of the next part of the usage gap is, will be will, will, will be very challenging. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, 
So I'm now going to, there's a, a number of questions in the chat, which is great. Um, so I'll try and see pull out as, as many as I can. Um, so what there's a question around the impact of COVID, both in terms of, if I understand the question correctly, in terms of when we went into lockdowns and such, how did that impact on um, internet, uh, mobile internet use, but then also now as where people are returning back to classrooms and offices and work, you know, how is that playing out? So do you have any thoughts or comments on the general impact of COVID on, on connectivity? Yeah, so I think it, uh, it, it's, it's one of the key things that we, we highlight in the report. So th there's probably two aspects around COVID. So we did see a, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say on, on the mobile internet side, at least, it wasn't a huge acceleration, but there was an increase in mobile internet usage and, and subscribers in 2020 and 2020. If you compare what we have last year with 2019, there was uh, there was a bigger increase than there was in the two years prior, which... You know, I, th I think it's it's very likely that was attributable to COVID. So we we have seen an increase in that regard. The other thing is we we're talking about adoption in terms of you know counting the number of people that are using mobile internet. But the second aspect is how how much you're using that or how intense are you using that that mobile internet um, that that mobile internet service. So that's also something that we look at in the report. And that in particular, I'd say is something we've probably seen more of a response to. So for those that were already using mobile internet, we've seen, for example, their, the, the amount of data they consume increased quite significantly uh, since 2019. And to, consistent with that, in our consumer survey, we ask users what they use the mobile internet for, uh, a number of services and use cases ranging from social media, access to mobile education, mobile health, e-government, and financial services. And for a lot of those use cases, um, for example, the accessing uh, free online video and video calling, the sorts of things a lot of people ne needed to do use the internet for during COVID, those things we saw a, a very significant increase in, in, in terms of usage. So yeah, I think what we've seen is definitely um, an impact of COVID-19, both on adoption, but also in terms of how people use mobile internet. Um, in in the last two years great thanks and one thing that also i think struck me from the from the data was just the percentage uh, in terms of the data usage you know a small portion of the population relatively small that are doing our high data uses and a lot of people are still lower which i think you know again highlights we need to address some of these these barriers if we're gonna mm -hmm. it's not a, a universal sort of the averages can mask some great disparities in terms of data use um <clears throat> So um, there's some, uh, sorry, just, there's quite a few questions. So just trying to go through uh, some questions about what we cover in the report. Um, maybe I'll just ask them and you can answer. Do we look at IoT from a mobile internet perspective? Um, do we, uh, does the report present spectrum adjusted results um, uh, um, comparing uh, those LDCs only with each other that still only possess 3G um, or other. So I think those are, sorry, I, I hope you can see the questions as well. Hopefully, if, um, I think you do want to answer, but you know, whether the, that our report covers it or if there's other ones that your team does. Yeah, sure. So within IoT, the, the report itself doesn't include um, IoT. What, what the report is really focused on is internet access uh, amongst, um, amongst uh, well, populations in the world, but especially in low and middle income countries. So it's around human users. So that's that's the focus of the report. Um, we do within GSMA, we have a number of other reports that look around um, the IoT and how that's growing trends in in different IoT use cases. So um, after this, if, uh, if the chat's still open, I can include some links to those. Um, on the spectrum side, um, so sorry, just looking at the question there. Come back. Yeah, no, that's that, that's that's a good question. So the, this year's report didn't look at that. We have had some previous reports that have uh, had some focus on spectrum. So you can look at, um, I forget, it could even actually be last year's state of mobile internet report or definitely earlier years. But in the um, in our mobile connectivity index that accompanies this report, where this is a tool that measures um, 
effectively looks at the key enablers of mobile internet adoption across 170 countries. So we have indicators measuring things like coverage, network quality, affordability, skills, content, um, access to locally relevant content. And one of the things we have there is around uh, spectrum as well. So for example, it specifically measures the amount of spectrum that has been assigned um, to operators and it looks specifically by band as well. So we can look at the spectrum available in low bands. Um, and indeed, that's one of the, um, what you often find is, is that those countries that have achieved higher levels of, of coverage and adoption are those that may have assigned more spectrum. Um, and those that, for example, not often just the amount of spectrum, but also those that have refarmed it so that it's technology neutral have often seen improvements as well. So I talked about the coverage of um, the, grow, the closing coverage gap. Some of the countries that have made the biggest progress there, uh, Nigeria comes comes to mind, is because their lower band, they uh, allow technology neutral spectrum usage in, in bands, particularly in sub one gigahertz bands. It allowed them to deploy 3G networks more quickly. Um, and I think, as I say, we've highlighted that in the report before. So, yeah, if, if you're particularly interested in that, um, there's some stuff in previous reports, but I'd also refer to the connectivity index as well, where you can get a, a, a further view of that. Thanks, Calvin. And there's also a question about, did the report look at what people use data for in specific markets? It does cover that. You've mentioned a little bit about how we've looked at how some of these use cases have um, been impacted by COVID. Um, but do you, is there anything um, that you wanted to say to say about how, you know, how people are using the data um, for any? Yep. No. I, as, yeah. As we we discussed, we we look at within our consumer survey. We ask a range of questions for those who are using the internet. What are the use cases they do? So there's a long list ranging from uh, accessing uh, video, video calls, mobile education, playing games, um, listening to music. So you'll see those uh, on there. Um, as as I mentioned, particularly since um, the last couple of years, we've seen an increasing usage of certain activities that. I suspect are strongly linked to the COVID pandemic around uh, watching free video, video calling, online working. Um, so yeah, that that information is in there. There's a there, there's quite a lot there. I suspect we could probably take a, a good two hours just to co cover that one that one graph in particular. But yeah, I would encourage if anyone is interested in that to look at that. Great. Um, there's some questions about closing the coverage gap, but I think you you answered that in a previous question um, and. Um, uh, there's questions about uh, if you have any comments around sort of price points that are needed for data to to be available and anything around um, uh, partnerships around the affordability gap. There's some questions on that. And if you have anything particularly you want to say on that point um, around sort of the price points or uh, yeah. approaches to addressing affordability. That yeah, no, I, th I think we touched on that. And you, as you, this is one of the, because th there's two parts to affordability. One is the pri price point itself. And then one is the one is the ability to pay. So, you know, what a, a service that's affordable could, you know, uh, for example, a $50 handset is going in terms of affordability is going to be very different in, in the UK, for example, than it is in, you know, uh, you know, in a country with a, with a much lower income profile. So that's that. That's why we look at it in that way, and in that sense, I think that's why the affordability thresholds that have been discussed have been based on income and not just not just looking at you know whether it's a you need a forty dollar handset or a thirty dollar handset. So I, th I think that is highlighted. Uh, I think particularly on the handset side, I probably would refer some of the people that are interested in that to the <laughs> to the handset affordability report that uh, Claire, your team published earlier this year where in addition to the different cost components, we also looked at, you know, what are the key drivers around demand and willingness to pay and how to how to drive handset access and, and further increase digital inclusion. So I think that probably articulates a lot of the the issues and some of the the um the yeah the 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 concerns around that but better better than I could now. Great. I think there's one last question I'm going to put to you. Um and then um I think we're getting towards the end of our time as well. Um so uh, so we've just published Summit 2022, and I think this is a, a good question. I'm not sure we have totally the answer for this, but uh, based on 2021 data, um, what do we expect from Summit 2023? Um, uh, um, 
do we have uh, any, I guess we could both try and answer that question. Uh, are we looking at new countries or new themes or anything that we want to highlight for what we might be looking at for next year? Yeah, good question. Um, so well, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll be updating this report and uh, the, the, mobile, the accompanying mobile connectivity index and doing surveys. So at the moment, uh, I probably couldn't give a firm answer. I think the way in which we approach this is probably coming from my from my analytical or economic background is we we go through quite an intense process of gathering all the relevant data early next year to try and get a view on what happened in 2022. And then we try and see what's most what it, what is most relevant and important from that. Obviously, at this point, we I can't really see other than you know obviously we've seen a lot of news stories and some initial data, but obviously we don't have a full view on on, on what's happened. So I think what one of the aspects that we do in this report, we there are some things that are fairly consistent over time, but some things that do change sort of year to year. So yeah, at the moment I'm not entirely sure what they are, but I'm looking forward to seeing what they could be. Uh, but I don't know, Claire, if you have any. any thoughts yeah, I mean, basically, we're planning to to really continue to track coverage, usage gap, connectivity, and looking at the barriers. One thing that we're quite excited about is that um, this year we'll be we're collecting for data for the first time from Ethiopia. Um, so that's sort of a, a new country that we haven't collected data from in the past. So um, we'll see what what that says. Um, but yeah, as uh, as you said, Calvin, um, really just trying to monitor the trends. I'm really keen to understand the longer term impact of um, of COVID. And I think that's why we also really looked at affordability and, and looked at, you know, people income levels and those in least developed countries, because it has really disproportionately impacted um, those who are poor. So I think we're going to continue to monitor that and see, you know, where COVID is how it is impacting those who are most vulnerable um and uh, see what we can we can see from that um but yeah definitely be um looking at what the trends are saying and 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 how how the different not just covid but some of these uh more recent sort of um uh crises in the world are are playing out and hopefully we'll have something interesting to say um but thank you so much for your time Calvin, and thanks to everybody for your for joining us and for your questions. Um, do do read the full report. There's a lot more detail um, than we were able to cover in this session. As Calvin mentioned, we also have a mobile connectivity index, which also has some detailed uh, information um, on a country by country for each country. So if you're interested in a particular country, you can go to that index as well and see what it says for that country. Um, and thank you, thank you very much, and uh, wishing everybody a good day. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, everyone.